We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, we are in uh, Katowice, and I'm very pleased to hear you all and to uh, you are to be connect. Uh, I'm so glad, and we um, will be happy to say welcome to some big, uh, be a pioneer of uh, internet here. Is uh, uh, Mr. Pouzin of French. He uh, is honored to be here with Chantal and the other of uh, uh, speaker who are here. Let me say thank to all the technical people who are here. They are going to help us to make this meeting be uh, successful. Merci à tout le monde. Uh, donc je disais que je suis heureux que à notre panel, on a l'honneur d'accueillir un des pionniers de l'internet mondial en la personne de Monsieur Louis Pouzin. Je, en Afrique, nous, dir, nous dirons Père Pouzin et Chantal. Euh, merci à, également à, aux, à, aux autres panélistes qui sont là et qui nous honorent de leur présence afin de faire de euh, ce panel un succès. Merci également à toute la technique euh, qui se déploiera dans le but de satisfaire, de faire de euh, ce direct euh, quelque chose d'extraordinaire. Merci à vous. Euh, sans protocole, il est l'heure. Ici, euh, on dit souvent que l'heure est l'exactitude de roi. Je veux passer la parole à qui de droit Charlie, tu as la parole. Merci, Michel. Grand plaisir de voir que euh, euh, ce panel est représenté est sur site et sur place. And so, thank you for that. Thank you for the effort to be there. Thank you for taking, you know, making all your toil and, and efforts to be there. And that's great. And I welcome Peter and, uh, and, and also Joanna and, and Rodrigue, uh, our panelists who are already here. And I think, as Michelle just said, we won't bother ourselves with uh, too much protocols. <laughs> we will certainly We we'll certainly make everything for our panel to be to be the best of it, and given the fact that we we have we've already we are already online and live now, I will start by presenting our 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 session, and we when we were preparing this session we we had so many so many topics at hand. And we were asking ourselves what can be the topic that is critical for, especially for our context, our continent. And uh, we finally, and very participatory, uh, um, in a participatory way and uh, collaboratively decided to work on, uh, you know, on the construction of infrastructure that will give, you know, meaningful, internet access to all the people in Africa, but especially those who are marginalized, those who are, those who are clearly excluded as we know it, even though we don't, we don't usually uh, uh, say it. It's, it's, it's something we need to put on the table and the IGF opportunity is also there for us to to put this on the table and to be the voice of all those people who might not be here because of the challenges that we will talk about in this session. And also because you know, of the fact that there are so many other issues that are not directly related to internet or internet governance or internet infrastructure itself, but also because of You know, we have problem with electricity, we have problem with poverty. People will, even when they will have means to join this sort of session, they will certainly be, 
more interested in solving, you know, daily needs, daily critical needs that are far from what we enjoy as those who consume internet every day. So uh, uh, the, the organizing committee of this session was formed by the Ministry of Post and Telecommunication in Cameroon by CAPDA and presented here by Michel Chonan Lindsay, its coordinator, one of the most prominent organization, Pan-African organization promoting internet governance for that has been promoting internet governance for decades now. And then uh, we also have Christian, who that we want to, to thank for all its dedication, for all its devotion to, to, to making all this, this session uh, uh, a success. So for our, for our session, we will have two moderators. Michelle is already there on site. And uh, Charlie, myself, is here. It's tricky to be presenting myself <laughs> this way. And then uh, we will have several speakers. And we are glad that many of you are already there online. And we, we love it. It shows clearly that the, the session, this session, and this session topic is a, uh, an interesting one and that all of us have understood clearly that we need to we need to advocate. We need to speak out this. We need to show, to to make clearly, uh, uh, um, to make it understandable that 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 infrastructure is critical for people to join. You know this space that is becoming now in some some sort of essential and existential existential. Uh, um, uh, uh, space for, for every human being today. And so we will have Joanna. I will start with her. It has nothing to do with the way, you know, with the ranking, with the spec speaking ranking here. But I think she was one of the first to, to come in from the panel, from the, from the speaker list. And so Joanna is a cybersecurity uh, expert working in the intersection of human rights, international law, you know, privacy, freedom of, of expression. And she is member of the European, uh, Eastern European group. And we will have, uh, I hope uh, he comes. Uh, Eric Sindel is uh, from private sector. And, uh, and he, is, he is actually one of the very great uh, promoter of uh, internet infrastructure in our in our country we also invited benga sesan of civil society we hope he he find a way to come benga is here because i'm in the room ah are you there yes i've been here <laughs> sorry benga my my screen doesn't show you thank you bro <laughs> as, as we call ourselves thank you brother that you that you are already there thank you and um uh, should i need to present benga <laughs> one of the one of the pro most prominent civil society activists on this on these issues of internet governance and we are very very glad to have you here and he leads uh, paradigm initiative and paradigm initiative is uh, the 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 pan african civil society organization social enterprise you know working on this uh, uh, leading leading this uh, uh, this topic in 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 Africa, and we are very glad to have you, Benga. Thank you, and sorry for for missing your presence here. <laughs> so we will also have Rodrigo Saungumi Sopele. He is a, 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 a tech, a jig for our community, and uh, he is member of uh, the African Group. We will certainly also have Ferdinand Yves Mbaga, 
who is also a, a tech and geek of this, uh, of this community and uh, working for the Cameroon Network Britain Group. And we will have Brice Arsen Ndanga. He is from government and he's also a member of this African, African group. And then last but not the least, Peter Koch from the NIC. He's a, a senior policy advisor from the NIC and working on the intersection of internal governance, public policy, government relations, and so on. And then we will have probably, or maybe Ngamba Serge, who is also a, a, an expert of this domain. This is our list of speakers, and then we will have rapporteurs, two rapporteurs who are, who are already here, Lidien Natalin Toge, that's from the Ministry of Post and Telecommunication in Cameroon, and then Neo Miller Marcel, that will lead this uh, reporting side of our session. And we, we welcome all of you here, and we would like now to start with our with our team, how will we how will we go with this? We will just give the floor to panelists for panelists to express their views on in the way they they feel it. And as you know, when we prepare this, we decided to to let you share freely your thoughts on this critical topic, so that we don't restrict it to our own view because we, we believe the, you know, the diversity of the panel is a great opportunity for us to capture very you know, great points that we could put on the table of IGF, uh, IGF lead, you know, so that we, we can push together what we need to make, to improve the state of infrastructure and then the state of internal governance in our, in our continent. And, and so to make it, you know, to create some sort of equality and to reduce, as you know, the, the space between the half and those who, who have not. So I will start with Benga. Hi Benga, could you please, Tell us all your insight from the wonderful experience you've built in this space concerning infrastructure, the challenges you have met and that you see people facing in the context, not only of Nigeria, but also of the continent, given your Pan-African uh, uh, position today. Thank you, uh, Benga. Thank you, uh, Charlie. Uh, and Great to be here. Uh, there's some echo. I hope that doesn't affect what I'm saying. But anyway, we when we talk about infrastructure, um, as you said, uh, I'm not I'm not even looking at my own country, Nigeria, today, and I'm not even limiting myself to the countries where Paradigm Initiative has you know physical offices. But I'm looking at the region as a whole, and I think one of the important opportunities that we have. Yes, there's a challenge of infrastructure. But one great opportunity that we have right now is the fact that, uh, you know, last year with the COVID-19 lockdowns, I think it became very clear that we are unfortunately uh, seeing a deepening of the digital divide. It means that when schools went online, we had no choice. We had to go online for schools. When, you know, businesses had to work remotely, when people literally had to, you know, communicate and do that online, what then began to happen was that we saw the wide gap between two categories of people. Uh, there was one category, people who are connected, uh, who can continue to learn, children who went online to continue to learn, uh, you know, adults who continued to work and all of that. But we had a second category of people. We had children who not only couldn't learn, but were forgetting what they were learning. And that is a major problem because what we then have is a scenario where those who are not connected 
mostly because of infrastructure. And like Charlie said earlier, it's not even at times that there are no, you know, uh, that there's no internet access, for example. It's also the fact that there, is, there are other infrastructural problems like power. Uh, you know, let me give you the example of some of the countries where we work uh, and we had scenarios where we had content to share with students, but some of them couldn't receive them. Not because there was no internet and, you know, on their phone, but because there was no power to charge it, the battery was dead. So literally they couldn't have access to that. Uh, and there were, of course, many other obstacles. But the good news is that we saw the prioritization of digital infrastructure uh, beginning from about March last year. Many of the countries that we've been talking to and saying to them, you have to prioritize digital infrastructure, began to see the need for it. So in a way, COVID is a bad thing, but it has put digital infrastructure on the map of many uh, African countries. And I think we need to make sure that as we now continue to have, you know, countries are now beginning to have post pandemic plans, that digital infrastructure must remain. Because the challenge we have is that, for example, we can never build enough schools. I almost, you know, I always give the example of a country like Nigeria where you have over 2 million students, 2.1 million students writing exams to go into tertiary institutions, but you have a scenario where all of the schools combined cannot take more than 600,000 or 620,000 students, which means one third of those who are writing exams are the only ones we have physical spaces for. But thankfully with digital infrastructure, we can extend health services, we can extend education, we can extend businesses, and we can do a lot of that. This, by the way, is one of the reasons why at Paradigm Initiative, our major interest when it comes to digital inclusion is to prioritize three things. Number one, that policy must work for the unconnected, for the disconnected, and when I say unconnected and disconnected, I mean there are people who are not connected to the internet because uh, maybe they live in rural areas or because they are you know, around the last mile, but there are those that are disconnected. Uh, there are countries where the internet is shut down uh, during elections or during exams, depending on the excuses that you know, those tyrants want to give. But the reality is that we must make policy work for them. So if students are in a region where the internet has been shut down at a time where supposed, they're supposed to learn online, then we have a major challenge, that's one. The second is that as civil society actors, we must begin to work with other stakeholders, civil society, technical community, government, businesses, we must all work together to make sure that everyone who you know, needs access to either health, education, have access to this, through digital infrastructure that we prioritize. And the last but not the least is the fact that across the continent, many of our countries already uh, have what is called universal services funds. And I think we must emphasize the need to deploy these resources towards extending digital infrastructure from Algeria to Zimbabwe, across you know, all of Cameroon, Ethiopia, every country, we have resources that have been put aside for this work. And I think it's high time we began to deploy that towards that because the reality is in the next five years, in the next 10 years, we can't come back as a continent and say, oh, once again, we've missed out on the fourth industrial revolution or other opportunities. It's high time we got, our, I mean, we literally put our, you know, money where our mouth is. Sorry. 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 Yes, I, will, I, I was mute. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Benga. Thank you for sharing these uh, insights. I will take here, and thank you also for keeping the time. I will take here the fact that we, we, we have good news from your point of view that COVID-19 has provoked, I will use this, <laughs> has been a sort of provocation for our states to prioritize in digital infrastructure because we, they saw how, you know, how far we as African countries, we lag behind and we were unprepared to cope with the the challenges of COVID-19. So thank you for that. And I also take the fact that you are advising us to, to work, you know, in sort of multi-stakeholders view, you know, taking in tech communities, legal, uh, legal stakeholders, and, you know, and social activists for sure, and all those who are, and given that 
uh, what we are talking about is, is just some sort of crossroads of many, many, many uh, uh, knowledge, sciences, and, and so on. So thank you for that. I will give the floor, if you allow me, in this sense to Eric that I see here, so that Benga was talking about this prioritizing in digital infrastructure. What do you think about this? And then you can share your insight in five minutes. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm really thrilled to be here and share uh, my experiences, my area experiences in terms of digital infrastructure. Uh, my predecessor said it the best. You know, we, we need to tackle this opportunity. We're in the digital age and an opportunity for underdeveloped country to, to bridge the gap uh, and, um, <clears throat> and reach development. So in terms of digital infrastructure, uh, the, main, the main infrastructure that we know, it's, you know, uh, underground sea cables. I mean, um, every country should invest into getting access to those underground uh, sea cables. So the first, that's the first issue. Uh, the second is managing that infrastructure. By managing it, we need to deploy it across the whole country and uh, put up uh, policies for different actors uh, to provide uh, connectivity to all the areas of the, the countries. And it has been proven that uh, broadband access and economic growth are very closely uh, related. So. For me, this is the first focus, um, broadband access. Second one is education. Uh, we need to move from the traditional education. You know, we have new, uh, new trades now in the digital field. We need to teach our youth how to develop their digital skills in order to adapt to the future. Actually, it's not the future, it's now already. Uh, uh, we have artificial intelligence, we have uh, big data, uh, robotics, and so on. So we need to, to transform the way we teach, our, we teach our, our children. And the third is increase uh, cybersecurity because with digital use, uh, there's also a lot of threats. So we need to invest into cybersecurity uh, training, of course, uh, sensibilization, and uh, we need to make our countries more digital ready. By by that I mean uh, we need to drive to draft policies in terms of data protections, in terms of uh, e-commerce, and so on. So uh, that's my take on it. And uh, like the predecessor said, uh, COVID has been. Uh, a blessing in disguise uh, for us to see how the future can be and how the digital, the digital technology can help us uh, achieve uh, our visions and our, our dreams. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for reminding us the aspect that we need to, we need to, 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 to you know, to take into as priorities, and you insisted on, on educating, educating our young people. And also you talk when it comes to infrastructure, as it is our the core of our session, you talked of uh, cyber security. And I think this is also an issue where infrastructure is key. Either, either our phones or you know our networks, all the, you know, all the switches and, uh, and, and, and the, 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 where all our cables lands, land and, you know, we need to have cyber security embedded by default in all those, 
in all the network and the infrastructure. So I take it as a, as a great point on this that we need not to, not to forget. But you, you also talk of the legal infrastructure that we need to build. And so we turn to, to Peter, who has been at the forefront of, uh, you know, uh, regulatory operations and, and, and projects in his context. So we would like to, to know what our countries need to build as legal, legal instruments, you know, based on, for sure, based on international standards, or maybe taking into account our own specificities. We would like to know what you could advise, you know, in the view of building uh, our uh, digital infrastructure. Peter? Yeah, thank you, Charlie. And thanks, thanks a lot for inviting me and uh, for the opportunity to have this discussion and participate in the dialogue. Very much appreciated. Um, as, uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, I am with DINIC, the uh, German top level domain registry, CCTLD. And I'm also with the German ISOC chapter. So at one point I might refer to, to some initiatives that the Internet Society has uh, started to support, say, community networks or something else. Um, so first, let me say that the, the pandemic, of course, has reshuffled the card deck um, for, for all of us uh, in, in various parts of the world. And um, this, this whole topic of meaningful access is, is um, very important, but it's also complicated in, in its definitions because meaningful means different things to, to different people in different contexts. So it is um, something that you compare to your peers. Um, and uh, it, it is important that, that people have a, a level playing field um, in, in terms of access. Um, and that might mean different resources in, in, uh, in different circumstances, but also there is obviously a baseline. Um, all of us are now having enough of infrastructure to participate in these Zoom calls, and that is maybe a new baseline. Um, so when I mentioned reshuffling, it is that, of course, many people had access to the internet uh, already and have it, but the internet meant big platforms maybe, and having Facebook and Twitter, until things changed when school kids needed to do a bit more, like having interaction like we have right now, or like being able to do their own um, research or take part in polls or whatever, take their own videos and, and things. Um, and that is a question of resources, but I'm not an economist, so I'm, I'm not talking about uh, funding and, and this, but it's also a, uh, an issue, I think, of, of education, as previous speakers have mentioned, of training. Um, and um, to, to go to the core of your question, to the, uh, say, ability to um, experiment in a way um, is so that the, say, legal or maybe liability frameworks uh, around you um, and enable experimentation, enable innovation, um, while at the same time, maybe exercising the protection that, that uh, uh, the, the people, the government expects in terms of, um, so not this Wild West approach, if that comparison is allowed. Um, cybersecurity and, and privacy was mentioned. And of course, one of the prime examples for, for privacy regulation or, or legislation is the uh, general data protection regulation in the, um, in the European Union um, that has been a, an example for, for lots of countries in the world. Um, what we sometimes see is that both topics, security and privacy, um, are maybe used a bit as a barrier, as an excuse for not starting things. Um, they are important, so they shouldn't be denied, I think, uh, also not in the uh, case of a pandemic. Um, but we also see it doesn't make sense if, if the access to certain tools like this one that we use right now would be denied for, for spurious reasons of, of data protection. So um, that, that's one thing. The other is this whole access, again, it's, you compare, everybody compares themselves to their neighbors. 
So if my bandwidth is this and my neighbor has 10 times the bandwidth, I'll ask why is that and, and what, what can we do? Um, um, so oftentimes local initiatives can not replace, but support general infrastructure. Um, there are always areas that are maybe for reasons of geography or others that are that are less connected in terms of bandwidth, say, than than others, and it might not be economically feasible for um, competing big telcos or or others to um, to go there. And there are, of course, multiple regulatory uh, approaches to that. One could be that uh, there's an obligation for service providers to support areas that are not necessarily economically attractive, but to have this base level of access. And the other one is, and that also happens in, uh, in, in my country from time to time, um, that local initiatives will say, accelerate this whole thing by locally supporting um, infrastructure. And I'm really talking about digging cables or, or doing, doing other things um, on rare occasions. But that might be an example where this is not replacing, but accelerating or supporting um, bigger infrastructure initiatives. And then of course, there needs to be regulatory or say um, legal opportunities to actually do this um, without going the risk of, of, of bankruptcy <laughs> or um, without having unnecessary liability or, or high regulatory burdens if you are a, say, a cooperative of, of small medium enterprises and you want to um, increase your, your bandwidth, it would be sometimes very hard if you had to register as an ISP where all what you do is support a local uh, thing. That, that's something to, to keep in mind that maybe this, uh, the, the regulatory sword um, can be can be sharp, but it can also be devastating in the wrong hands or wrongly applied. Uh, again, if that if that uh, image is is allowed, so um, taming the big incumbents is one thing, but at the same time, uh, local initiatives and sm small emerging initiatives um, should should be on the radar and not be strangled by by a regulatory burden. That is. And I'm not saying regu like regulation is bad in the first place, but level playing field means that um, the application of regulation to um, to big entities, uh, it needs to scale is, is what I'm trying to say, right? It, it needs to uh, address bigs, big entities in a way that they can um, can cope with and maybe need some leeway for, for local um, initiatives. And speaking of initiatives, that's then the, um, how would one organize this? Uh, cooperatives are, uh, an interesting model all over the world. Um, oftentimes in, um, in, in, in farming and, and, and everything like that. But as a registry, for example, we are also a cooperative and, and the uh, cooperative members are the registrars. And this also works for, um, for local initiatives in, in terms of having a small local ISP, so to speak. Um, it is not for profit, it is self-governing and if the regulatory framework uh, allows that, then um, this is this is probably an, an interesting nucleus um, for for bigger things. So you um, get together, then you can have internet exchanges in the same model. And this is where I would hand off and then refer to what the Internet Society is doing in that direction. Um, so you have interconnections and so on and so forth. So that's a bit of an uh, a long stretch <laughs> to respond to your question. Uh, happy to hear what others have to say. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Peter. As for, as with your predecessors, great insights. And you, and I, I, will, I will pick some of the things that you talk about, local initiative. Because when, once we think of infrastructure, you know, in our minds, we have, you know, big store, big towers. We have uh, big cable, submarine cable, and and all those things. And um, I think you are right. There are places, areas in our countries, especially in our countries, where uh, many solutions from ISPs won't be economically feasible, and that's clear. And uh, most of them have so great power that compared to our government that, you know, they have negotiating power that we don't, that we don't actually match 
and we understand that. And I would take maybe things that come from what you said, cooperatives. I will maybe add, you know, providing for community networks, more community networks, maybe, you know, looking at mesh, mesh networks, things like that. We, we need to look at, at all these, you know, and especially when you talk of not-for-profit, this makes also sense because it will, it will feed in, you know, this community spirit that we are not here to make profit, but just to serve the, commu the community. And then I would also take the fact that we, we need to make sure we don't take cybersecurity as an excuse <laughs> not to do things. And I agree with you personally that we need to, to look at internet connectivity or maybe internet infrastructure or internet governance in the sense of producing value for the society, not for absolutely in a defensive mode as we, we usually do. Uh, um, with the reserve that we understand clearly that uh, uh, security is, uh, is, a, is a serious, serious matter. So thank you for, 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 sharing, for sharing this. And I will end uh, by also asking for our uh, uh, rapporteur to, 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 to stress the fact that we need a legal environment that gives ways you know, to local initiative to thrive you know, in this, uh, in this space. So thank you for that, for that, Peter. And I will, as you just said, talking about these local initiatives, I will turn now to Rodrigue, Rodrigue Sangumi, who is uh, a member of the Cameroon Network uh, 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 operators, operators group. And these are, you know, when we talk of <laughs> operators, it's clear that they are the one trying to design you know, solutions, you know, to, to reach the last mile, I was us as we usually say. So I will ask him what he can tell us for this in five minutes. And I see a few questions in the chat box. Thank you for, for sharing. We will, we will get back to those questions once we end with uh, this first, mm -mm, first stage from the panelists here. So, Rodrigue. You are telling us in the in the chat that you had that you have slides. I hope we can share those, and uh, I will try. Christian, can you share Rodrigue's slide? I'm watching. Hello. Is it possible to share your slides? I don't know. Will you share it from your from your screen? I'm actually asking the host to do that because I'm just the oh. co-host, but I cannot do that. Okay. Thank you then. Thank you. Thank you. And so, so yeah, it's okay. You can share it. Okay, perfect. So Christian, you can share. Uh, Rodrigue, I, I know you have not sent your presentation. Maybe you can share if you have it yourself. Rodrigue, could you share, please? Okay. Perfect. Yes, Five minutes you. then. You okay. have the floor. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Um, my best language is French. I can, I can speak in French now. Hello? Yes, go ahead. You can speak okay, bonjour, in bonjour, bonjour à tout le monde. Euh, je vais partager en cinq minutes, comme vous avez demandé, euh, l'expérience de l'Université de Ngaoundéré au Cameroun sur la gestion des ressources de façon autonome. Euh, le plan de présentation est assez simple. Euh, nous avons présenté un petit peu notre institution, euh, les infrastructures et les ressources de 2010 à 2018, euh, les infrastructures de 2018 à 2020 et de 2020 à aujourd'hui. Euh, relativement à euh, la survenue de la crise sanitaire à COVID-19. À COVID et ensuite, euh, nous allons vous exposer un petit peu, très rapidement, les difficultés que nous avons rencontrées et faire une, une conclusion de notre, notre présentation. Euh, déjà, euh, l'Université de Ngaoundéré est, est un établissement public, une université publique parmi les huit qu'on a au Cameroun, 
avec environ 30 000 étudiants, 700 enseignants, avec un ratio étudiant-enseignant de 42 étudiants pour un enseignant, euh, et en 12 établissements, euh, dont 6 facultés et, et 6 grandes écoles. Euh, les facultés, nous avons la faculté des sciences, la faculté des sciences économiques et de gestion, comme vous pouvez le voir à travers le slide, et nous avons également des grandes écoles comme l'INSAI, où euh, je suis enseignant permanent ici, euh, et d'autres écoles comme l'Institut universitaire des technologies, l'école des vétérinaires, les GEM, l'EXIM, euh, l'école normale, et ainsi de suite. Euh, nous avons trois campus, trois grands campus. Euh, le campus principal qui est en Gaoundéré, ici, et un campus euh, qui se retrouve euh, du côté de, de Berthois, toujours dans la Damawa, ici dans la, Damawa, la région de la Damawa, nous avons un campus à Meganga, et un autre campus du côté de Garoua, dans la région du Nord Cameroun. Le campus de Berthois, qui héberge l'école normale euh, dans la région de l'Est Cameroun. Euh, L'Université de Ngaoundéré dispose d'un centre de commande des TIC. Euh, C'est d'ailleurs à travers ce centre-là que nous pouvons exercer euh, euh, l'autonomisation en matière de gestion des ressources euh, et infrastructures TIC. Okay. Donc, ce centre a un bâtiment, nous avons un bâtiment dans ce centre avec une ligne spécialisée à fibre optique qui a été posée par l'opérateur Camtel d'une bande passante à l'origine de 7 mégabits par seconde. Euh, nous avons également une salle de machines, serveurs, et un set serveurs fonctionnels, qui avait sept serveurs fonctionnels à l'époque, dont un serveur DNS, web, mail, backup, firewall, ainsi de suite, et un routeur de liaison avec l'opérateur de télécommunication comme tel. Tous les serveurs sont euh, à une adresse publique. Les réservations, nous avons également un nom de domaine, univ ndré .cm, qui est euh, euh, détenu dans les registres de l'Antique. Donc, euh, au bout de tout ceci, nous, nous avons euh, euh, le ministère de l'Enseignement supérieur qui nous a fourni 1024 adresses IP publiques, euh, mais en utilisant les adresses IPv4, nous étions contraints d'utiliser le NAT pour pouvoir résoudre les problèmes de connectivité de l'ensemble de la communauté universitaire. Nous avons également deux sondes de euh, Atlas Reaper qui sont déployés dans le réseau. Euh, déjà, en termes de, de difficultés que nous avons eu à rencontrer euh, euh, relativement au, à nos installations de départ, c'est que le, le réseau était instable parce qu'il s'agissait d'un réseau qui n'était pas à fibre optique dans l'intranet, en ce qui concerne l'intranet, c'était un réseau à ondes hertziennes et l'instabilité de ce réseau euh, à, à antenne nous a poussé à, à à penser un nouveau réseau qui était plutôt à fibre optique, dont un backbone euh, local à fibre optique, afin de, de, de rendre ce réseau plus stable avec une meilleure bande passante, permettant également euh, l'utilisation des services, d'autres de, de, services sur Internet et en intranet. Naturellement, nous avons constaté aussi que, euh, avec les adresses que le ministère de l'enseignement supérieur nous avait remis, nous avons des difficultés euh, sur Internet parce qu'en réalité, le ministère de l'enseignement supérieur avait acquis un grand bloc d'adresses et avait distribué un certain nombre à des universités, dont 1024 à l'Université de Gaoundé, je pense 2048 à l'Université de Gaoundé 1. Et nous constations que ces adresses étaient très mal utilisées par d'autres structures. Et les effets, c'est que nous nous retrouvions parfois blacklistés sur Internet lorsque nous voulions rendre accessible un certain nombre de services chez nous. OK nous constations aussi avec ce bloc d'adresse que Camtel avait des sérieux problèmes de routage de ce bloc. Donc, de 2018 à 2020, nous avons étendu avec l'arrivée du nouveau recteur à l'université, le professeur Oufoué Chinjemelo, à l'université de Ngaoundéré. Elle a permis à ce que le, le plateau technique soit euh, évolué avec euh, un nombre de serveurs qui a été ajouté, n'est-ce pas nous avons, chaque serveur avait désormais euh, la possibilité d'avoir son réplica, avec l'acquisition également euh, de 50 points d'accès sans fil euh, maillé, pour un réseau maillé, et la bande passante qui a été augmentée de 7 mégas à l'origine à 21 mégas. <rire> Ça peut faire rire, mais c'est une réalité ici chez nous. Les bandes passantes ne sont pas très élevées. Mais également, nous sommes devenus membres d'Afrique en ayant nos propres blocs d'adresses IPv4 et IPv6, n'est-ce pas, depuis, 2000, depuis 2018, le, pro, le, le projet a abouti. 
Mais naturellement, nous sommes en train de travailler avec Camtel pour le routage de nos adresses IPv6 dans leur, dans leur réseau. Et depuis l'avènement du, du coronavirus en, en 2019, donc euh, les effets ont été ressentis en 2020, en l'année académique 2019-2020 euh, euh, à l'Université de Ngaoundéré, qui était contraint, n'est-ce pas, de revoir rapidement son plateau technique euh, avec l'augmentation de, de la bande passante qui est passée cette fois-ci de 21 mégas à 100 mégabits, n'est-ce pas, pendant cette période-là le déploiement de l'augmentation des serveurs afin de donner des serveurs afin d'avoir des serveurs dédiés n'est-ce pas à l'enseignement à distance euh, à, à l'université de Ngaoundéré, ce qui nous a fait avoir huit serveurs supplémentaires uniquement dédiés aux plateformes de cours en ligne et malgré euh, que nous avions commencé depuis 2019 avec Camtel euh, le routage de nos blocs d'adresses IPv6 cela n'était pas toujours euh, opérationnel jusqu'en 2020 les difficultés que nous avons rencontrées de façon générale, c'est que nous avons un problème énergétique au pays et ça se ressent de façon criade ici dans la, la partie septentrionale du Cameroun. Euh, L'administration fait des efforts euh, dans ce sens en essayant d'acquérir un groupe électrogène, naturellement, mais nous pensons à une solution hybride, groupe électrogène, euh, plaque solaire, euh, mais les ressources financières ne permettent pas de, de résoudre le problème de façon rapide. Donc, nous allons prendre un certain nombre de temps pour pouvoir euh, peut-être pallier à cette, à cette solution. Nous avons également un problème de ressources humaines, euh, en, technique en fait, ressources humaines techniques euh, dans le domaine de la connaissance de, de la gestion, n'est-ce pas, au quotidien d'un réseau euh, IP, IPv6 ou IPv4 d'ailleurs même. Euh, je suis actuellement le, le seul qui a été formé euh, par Afrinique à, à la maîtrise des réseaux IPv6. Naturellement, nous sommes, nous sommes après 2020, donc en 2021, et jusqu'ici, euh, le routage de nos, de nos blocs d'adresses IPv6 se traîne toujours du côté de Camtel. Bon, en conclusion, on peut, on peut dire que euh, l'Université de Ngaoundéré, grâce à son centre de commande des TIC, euh, a la possibilité de gérer de façon autonome ses ressources et ses infrastructures numériques. Nous avons constaté qu'au courant des années, euh, les, les ressources ont évolué. Par exemple, nous avons euh, ce, ce graphe qui nous présente euh, ce que nous avons dit tout à l'heure. En termes de serveurs, nous sommes passés de, de, de 7 à, à 10 et actuellement nous sommes à 18. En termes de bandes passantes, nous sommes passés de 7 à 21 et actuellement nous sommes à, à, à 100 mégabits. Et naturellement, nous avons toujours ce problème de, ce problème de, de routage chez Camtel et le problème énergétique qu'il faut, qu faut résoudre. Et nous avons un grand espoir, n'est-ce pas, que le projet présidentiel euh, e-National Higher Education Network, qui est en cours euh, d'exécution actuellement, avec un, bâtiment, un nouveau bâtiment TIC qui a été construit dans les huit universités d'État, euh, dont l'Université de Ngaoundéry d'ailleurs en a bénéficié, et l'annonce du ministre de l'Enseignement supérieur qui nous a dit que lorsque le bâtiment sera opérationnel, nous passerons à une bande passante de 1 gigabit par seconde dans chaque université d'État. Sur ce, je vous remercie pour votre aimable attention et reste ouvert aux, aux questions et aux critiques. Je vous remercie. Merci, Rodrigue. Merci. And thank you, thank you for you know, giving a sort of description of what a state university, you know, in charge of training, of training students and Cameroon youth, and even Central African youth, uh, 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 is actually facing. And this is this is interesting because it, it, you know, it brings us back to what we said through uh, Benga, uh, Peter, and Eric, and <laughs> as we saw that there are so there are so many challenges that we need to. To take on and and you see clearly that you are a state university and you face challenges that are actually the same and and it shows clearly the kind of acute challenge that those who are those who don't have your resources you know my face in rural areas in where you just have communities who are not even aware of how they can just uh, 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 across those challenges and enjoy internet. And you, you also talk of your bandwidth, you know, moving from um, 
from uh, 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 seven megabyte to, to 21 megabyte and then now to 100 megabyte. And this can tell us, hey, you, you, you seem to think like it is not even enough. If we can just think of our communities, we will see that we are probably still struggling and uh, swimming in kilobytes, you know, just, just that one. And given, just to get back to some of the things that were said here, given the fact that we are now in a state of, you know, using videos for, you know, in this COVID-19 time, if we want to educate our young people at school and so on, you see clearly that what we have now, you know, at the level of the community, it's absolutely nothing. Because as you said, uh, one of the panelists said, uh, uh, when, as we use Facebook and WhatsApp, we might think we are actually enjoying internet, but when you have the needs, you know, imposed by, by COVID-19 today, especially for the uh, 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 educative community, you see clearly that we, we, our session is absolutely justified. And that's why uh, uh, I will take here that you, you, you said something that was critical for this evolution at the level of your university, a change of leadership. You talk of the fact that when you had a change of the rector of your university, you also saw a tremendous improvement in the, you know, in the capacity that you get, that you, 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 you enjoy now. So we also need to take this as a critical point that the kind of leadership that we have, a leadership that is aware of the needs, you know, of the capacity needs of our institutions, of, or of our country, this leadership is a, is a serious point that we need to think about. And if our leadership is not aware, we need, and now we'll get back to what Benga said, we need to make sure they understand. And this, this requires us to work with them and to tell them, because they don't know what they don't know. And at times, as civil society activists or as experts coming into these type of sessions, we know more than most of our leaders and our uh, uh, regulators. So we need, we, this is what I take from your, from your session. And then I will give the floor to Joanna to, you know, from her vast experience to sum up this and tell us what we should do, you know, what we should do now as we have gathered of all this insight. Oh, hey, the floor is yours, Joanna. Thank you, Charlie. A, that is a huge challenge. Thank you for putting it on my shoulders. And B, I would never trust myself to make recommendations uh, to such significant challenges. This has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for having me on board. I particularly appreciated the last presentation, working at a university, some of these challenges seem very similar. I think that's my personal takeaway from this session, regardless where you are, simple things like ensuring your kids right to education online in COVID times is universal. Ensuring reliable access that is based on principles that reflect societal values is something we all strive for. Now, as you rightfully noted, I work at a university here in, in Poland, in Lodz, um, and I work on international law and internet governance. So the research scope is quite broad. It spans from cybersecurity all the way to human rights. And I did note in our conversations a call for a sustainable framework that countries which are now just building their infrastructures or expanding their infrastructure could fall, fall back on. I heard underwater cables being mentioned. I held human rights. I appreciated Peter putting emphasis on privacy with GDPR. My takeaway from this session is that to some extent, the fact that many African uh, nations and states, and I've had the opportunity to participate in quite a few workshops during this IGF that focused on different regions of this vast and rich continent 
and highlighted individual challenges. Now, my takeaway is that we can indeed offer solutions that worked better or worse in different regions. When you are facing the challenge other regions have uh, faced before, you can pick and choose a solution that you seem feasible. You can look at the example of privacy and GDPR. Europe put forward a proposal with the GDPR to protect individual privacy in a specific manner. You will witness our friends and colleagues in the US approaching this topic in a very different manner, where data is a commodity. You will see Chinese infrastructure being introduced into various regions in Africa without the human rights mandate that Europe usually proposes. So from that point of view, the African states have a relative freedom of choice to decide which principles and norms they wish to adapt. Now, being a European lawyer, I'm gonna say that the framework is already in place. We do have an international law regime that clearly regulates, for example, access to the internet, for example, sustainable development. We have discussed during this IGF how best to approach this challenge from different African perspectives. My major takeaway is to facilitate meetings like this one, where we address the problems, we name them, we build capacity around them, but we also advance involvement. The discussions that you're having in your regional fora are universal ones. They are happening at the IGF and that's wonderful, but they are also happening at the ITU. Peter just briefly mentioned ISOC. ISOC is doing a wonderful job also in Africa, targeting individual projects, funding them, supporting them through community networks that will facilitate both building the infrastructure, but also building the capacity to make best use of it. I would say we do have in place a norms-based order that is there to protect the unprotected, the unconnected, as one of our panelists have said. We need to design the network in such a way that it is friendly to the end user. It protects their rights and interests. How do we do that, however? you will see increasing involvement of governments within the UN, and IGF is in itself a UN forum, but also in other multi-stakeholder forums. Now, I've had the opportunity to meet some of the panelists and the organizers within the ICON community. That is a standard setting body built on the multi-stakeholder model. Active involvement there will ensure that local values are presented in uh, this international dialogue. That is something I struggle with myself also locally, the awareness of how these global debates impact individual end users is relatively low. There is this debate going on, for example, around satellite access to internet. Seems very distant where you're struggling to provide more um, than uh, the average speed of access as we could just see on the slides when you're struggling to ensure power satellite access to internet seems so remote so unimportant but these frameworks are being built right now if you want to make sure that your interests are reflected in the way that these networks will work the time to act is now so i welcome all of these concerns and i identify with these I have kids at school and when we are all online, the internet just stops and they can't use their uh, right to education. It is an African problem. It is a regional problem, but we repeat that problem universally. If we want to make sure that the internet remains open and accessible, we just need to make our voices heard. I'm going to stop here. I'm happy to elaborate on international law, state responsibility, cybersecurity, due diligence, privacy, freedom of expression. You just need to ask a question and I'll go on. But I think that's my takeaway from this session. We need to make our voices heard and the problems that you will find with others are very similar to your own. Thank you for having me. This has been a very interesting and fruitful discussion. Thank you, Jonah. Thank you for reminding us something that Benga talked about at the beginning of this. And it's good to, to you know, to be closing this panel part of the session 
talking of this multi-stakeholder space that we need to invite. Because if, if countries are not there, if you are not there, your voice won't be there. And if your voice is not there, you won't be heard. And then your, <laughs> your interest won't be, won't be on the table. And I think this is very important, especially when we talk of, when we talk of, this, uh, of, this, of the topic of this session, building infrastructures, because most of the norms and principles that you just reminded us about, has to do with the future of what internet will become. You know, we have internet of things looming. We have these access to satellites. We have these issues of submarines cable and who manages what, who governs what in this, on this, uh, when it comes to infrastructure. And most of the time, our countries are so much struggling with local problems, with so many local problems that those, you know, multi-stakeholders, global spaces are not our place. We don't get there because we we have so many so many issues to solve our, at homes here, and so we. It's good to to remind us for, especially for some of us here who are Africans who live here, to understand that we need to have you know to use our our eyes, all our eyes, the right and the left one, so that we look at what is happening up there. And then we also, without neglecting what is going on here. And, and for this, it's clear that our, our regulators, our leaders clearly needs, and it's good that you remind us this, needs to care about the type of principles and norms we adhere to, because we can't just be taking in every type of infrastructural solutions because most of the time they can just be you know you know just kind of tool to hook us as you see it in geopolitics that you just named and you you talk of china you talk but it's true that in this competitive world we can't be thinking that there are people out there thinking for African interests, even when it comes to infrastructures. The truth is that there are so many things going on there. There are data, data, the digital and data economy requires, you know, some sort of data. And Africa now, data in Africa is absolutely a free space. You can come here and harvest it through your infrastructure, and then you build your artificial intelligence strategy from our own from our own data. And while doing this, you can also work to exclude African people as we see it in the AI solution that has been designed so far. We see currently that, uh, that there are biases everywhere when it comes to those solutions. So thank you for, for reminding us that we need to step in those spaces, ICANN, ISOC, IGF, and making sure that clearly our voice is there and that we are there for our own interest, not to repeat what is being said, because what is being said there are the interests of the people saying, saying it. So thank you for this. And uh, it's interesting that we have few time left and then we could consider what, is, what has been said in the, in the chat box by the by, by our participants so that no one is left behind here. So I will start with, if you allow me, I will start with uh, Raquel. That was just asking us, can you just approve a regulation for community network? And this is going in the line of what we just said. Do you think it will favor the deployment of last mile connectivity or there are other infrastructures issue to be tackled? First, so this could happen in rural community. I will get back to Benga to ask him, please Benga, what do you think about these two questions? It seems like uh, they are searching for you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Shali. Uh, good question there. Of course, what we need is a multiplicity of solutions, right? Uh, and I said earlier, and I think it's really important uh, to say this because right now we've got, you know, Facebook, Google, and many other companies who are, you know, uh, 
players in their own interest, uh, bringing infrastructure projects, and many of our governments are jumping at them, uh, which is which is okay. Like I said, it has to be multiplicity of of, of solutions, uh, and that's why I mentioned earlier the need to focus on some of the funds that have been deliberately targeted at last mile solutions. We know that when businesses, when telecom companies set up infrastructure, they focus on where they can make money. And this is where the, you know, why licenses have all these universal service obligations. But the beauty of community networks are three key things. Number one is that it is community owned. It is the fact that they know the problem. It is a lived it is lived experience, so they know that these are the specific problems we're trying to solve, uh, either it's in education or in health or in various areas. The second is that unlike big businesses uh, that are looking for the looking at the bottom line, community network interventions are mostly focused on the solution and not on the profit. And that's really important. And I think that the third and maybe even the most important is the opportunity to scale the solutions. We can have community network solutions uh, focused particularly in small communities, and then we can have them scale and learn from all those. So I think absolutely what Kenya has done uh, is an example that countries across the continent can learn from. Uh, I know that there are countries where, you know, a parliament initiative, we've been having conversations with them on making sure that community networks are possible and that there are, you know, legal frameworks around that to support and also to inspire that. Uh, and I think we need a lot of that. And like I said, it's a multiplicity of solutions and community networks play a major role in making sure that we get access to the last mile. Because to be honest, our problem is not landing cables. You know, all of the cables that have landed across, you know, the uh, undersea cables that have landed across the coast of various countries in the continent actually bring a lot of bandwidth. The real challenge is the last mile, and that's where community networks play. And that's why I think it's an important, you know, uh, addition to, to this. And it, of course, it's not new. It's, it's been done across various places, and we can learn from, you know, the experiences there. Thank you. Thank you, Benga. Thank you. Uh, once you speak now, you are already summarizing everything. So I want to resummarize. <laughs> so thank you for this. And, uh, and Enric said in uh, 2006, the fifth international conference, simulation, designing, and control of foundry processes was organized in Poland. <laughs> it's just fortunate that we are in Poland now. One presentation was a line scope of uh, presentation of paper, and designing and control of these processes in real time. Similar technical conferences can now be held online. I would like uh, 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 Peter to, to comment this, this comment, because it's actually uh, talking of the need of conferences that address these topics, you know, from infrastructure standpoint of view, from processes, from procedures you know to be held online so what are, what do you think of uh, this comment it, it was not a question it was a comment and but i would like you to comment it thank you yeah thanks uh, charlie uh for for um posing that question so uh let me go back to that question um oh yeah so i uh, yeah i um if, if I get that comment correctly, that is, <clears throat> it is an example, <clears throat> excuse me, it is an example of um, make, making, making access to information and to um, international cooperation easier by, by online access. And, and I think that is also what we currently um, experience in terms of accessibility of uh, all of these conferences. One of these paradoxes of the internet working is that um, despite we're talking about networks all the time, we are also keeping on traveling. Um, now, by this disruptive pandemic that, that prevents that, um, and actually it, it has its, its downsides in terms of face-to-face uh, -face communication, but it also um, kind of creates a level playing field uh, for, for many new entrants, and it also changes the way the discussions um, are, are held. Um, as opposed to uh, having face-to-face -face or hybrid meetings. Um, 
So uh, I, I think the comment was not so much about the, the content of the conference, but the change from, from uh, presence to, to going online. And I think that is, uh, uh, that, that is a good example of what, what happened in a, say in an unforeseen or, or disruptive way. And uh, this also works, of course, for <clears throat> at the say at a national level. Uh, many of um, many of the conferences, and we could talk about national IGFs, for example, um, will will be in the capital, right? Um, in in normal times, and um, depending on the size of the country, and uh, depending on how on on how many how many centers you actually have. Um, it is probably now much easier to uh, involve different perspectives from different regions within a country. And that is probably not so much different between the different continents. Uh, it it will, will happen everywhere. So from, from that perspective, I think uh, that is something that we um, should take advantage of and maybe preserve when we go back to say hybrid or face-to-face or -face meetings. It's important that the additional actors that we um, see enter the stage that we don't lose them, but encourage even more people to um, continue bringing their perspective and, and taking part or participating in the discussion. Um, yeah, hope that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for reminding us that we need to keep, uh, you know, this trend. And it's a good trend because it can give to those who who cannot afford to be in Katowice, to be in, to be in Katowice, uh, really, as we see it now. So thank you for, for, for that. Uh, uh, another question was uh, from Avis, uh, one of our greatest activists here in uh, the country. And he was asking, talking about infrastructure, I will give this question to Eric, if he doesn't, if he, he doesn't mind me. Are we satisfied? How the internet exchange point is actually implemented in the field in our account, African countries? And then do we, do we really have a change in the life of internet users? I guess uh, people here will guess the, the, rest, the answer to this, but Eri will tell us the truth on this. Eric? Yes, thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Uh... Actually, it's funny because I have the same question and that's, that's a question that I asked uh, to uh, a local, when we, when we had our local IGF, I think last month. Uh, so um, what I know is we had a project to deploy our IXP uh, in Yaoundé and Douala and uh, now I don't know if they are operational, so, so I cannot provide the answer. I'm looking for the answer my, my, myself. And it's, and it's very important because it's part of the national digital infrastructure that we need to, to set in place in order for us to, to go forward. So I wish I had the answer, but unfortunately I, I don't, but it's a very uh, pertinent question. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. But so I will, and Michel is removing his, uh, uh, and I was trying to, to give the floor to Michel for this specific question, because I think it's, uh, uh, Michel, will you, will you mind giving something on this question? Merci beaucoup, Charlie. Uh, en ce qui concerne uh, le volet infrastructurel uh, au Cameroun, Comme j'ai eu déjà eu l'occasion de le dire, effectivement, euh, le gouvernement du Cameroun, avec ses acteurs, ont essayé de mettre sur place euh, euh, un point d'échange. Il y en a deux, à Douala et à Yaoundé. Euh, je crois qu'ils sont désormais au niveau de, de comment gérer ces points d'échange, en fait. Euh, Camix, euh, qui est un consortium des fournisseurs d'accès, Euh, fait partie donc de, des personnes qui interviennent dans ce domaine. Mais je dois avouer quand même que cela nécessite encore une clarification par rapport à la gouvernance de ces points d'échange. Et euh, une des recommandations, en son, euh, il y a quelques semaines lors de, du, du, du IGF Cameroun, c'était qu'il fallait essayer de voir dans quelle mesure on devait impliquer toutes les entités 
afin de faciliter le bon fonctionnement des points d'échange. Euh, euh, cette problématique est aussi importante euh, au niveau de la sous-région Afrique centrale, puisque le Cameroun a hébergé par la suite également euh, l'IGF Afrique centrale. On sait qu'il y a un point d'échange euh, au Gabon, un point d'échange euh, au Congo, Brazzaville, euh, qui sont en fait euh, des, 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 euh, des références, des échantillons euh, mis en place par l'Union africaine. Mais euh, au jour d'aujourd'hui, on n'a pas encore vécu l'impact de ces points d'échange dans notre sous-région, ce qui appelle à une coordination des points d'échange. C'est ce que je peux dire là-dessus. Donc, en fait, notre sous-région, comme toute l'Afrique, souffre d'un problème de coordination qui sont parfois euh, dus à des obstacles liés au, à la, aux, aux différentes constitutions. On n'a qu'à voir avec les soucis qu'on a aujourd'hui à finaliser le processus de la Convention africaine de Malabo. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Michel. Merci de, de nous rappeler parce que je pensais bien que euh, tu avais euh, des points là-dessus parce que tu en parles souvent. So, uh, thank you for giving us these uh, technical insights and real technical insights on um, internet exchange points. And now I will turn to Joanna to asking, this is my own question, to asking how are we going as African countries to, you know, to relate to what you advised? When, when it comes to budget allocation, we don't actually allocate enough you know, enough budget or financial resources to this transversal solution that internet governance uh, uh, provide, uh, is. Because internet and internet governance in a country is now a transversal issue and it, it, it crosses everything now. And so we need to, how can African countries succeed in applying what you said when we see clearly that they don't allocate enough resources for that in their budget, in their yearly budget or in their middle term budget. Thank you, Charlie. So I understand that your question focuses largely on the role of states, right? The governments who manage uh, public funding. Now, that is just one part of the puzzle, right? Internet governance is three groups of stakeholders acting in their respective roles. So before I try to focus on the role of the states, please let me highlight that within the multi-stakeholder environment, as broad as it is, including the IGF, as we meet here today, including ICANN, where uh, I've had the opportunity to meet some of the panel members, including ISOC, including ITF. African leaders from various parts of the continent are very active. Now, I, I love the work that I do at the university. I spend, as many of the panelists do, far too much time at ICANN meetings, which do not come with the university mandate. I do it because I kind of feel it's important. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm right, but, but I do it because I feel it is. And I feel as if in Africa, you have wonderful community leaders from the tech industry, from civil society, who also do it just because they care, right? So that's the funding issue aside, but I do uh, understand where your question is coming from. We look at the states as the leaders of these policies and we meet at the IGF, which is a UN event and United Nations is an intergovernmental uh, organizations. So let's go back to the role of the state, putting civil society, technical community, businesses aside. They have their own funding and reasons. Some of us, uh, the most idealistic ones, for, for participating. But when we look at the government, their role largely is to facilitate consensus building. And this can take on different forms. So this could be building a platform where we can talk together. Again, African countries have been the leaders of NRIs, the national regional initiatives around the IGF, where it often has been the governments who have facilitated a platform to build consensus and to move forward. I would argue that there are good practice examples to follow. 
I'm not sure I'm the most competent person to ask how you guys do it. I just look in awe and I say, well, great job. I don't know how you do it, but it works in many African countries. I'm not sure there is in European countries, in Poland, a dedicated internet governance feed of funding. So I'm not sure, well, the IGF is, is a wonderful endeavor, but do kindly know this is the prime minister who's managing all of the work going on. I've heard some of uh, the African leaders here at the IGF say, well, maybe it should be at the highest level of government where internet governance related decisions are made. So I don't feel competent to tell you who should make the call, how much money should go into supporting internet governance. That's something that every country decides for themselves. But I can highlight why it's worth doing. And the examples we've uh, already put on the table with kids being at school, with national voices being heard, with uh, protecting the unaware, the unconnected, the unprotected, because the government has an obligation, if we talk the human rights narrative, a positive obligation to protect individuals, also their human rights. So if I was trying to give you a narrative why the government is obliged to act, I would say, well, we've elected them or we have to put them there because we want them to foster our best interests, even if we don't know what those are, right? And how they do it, effectively impacting internet governance processes, like those satellites I mentioned that will be flying over Africa in a few years, and again, it might be too late to intervene there. So I would leave it to regional and national leaders to decide how they split the money. I'm just a Polish academic. I wouldn't trust myself to tell you how to do it. But I would point to good practice examples in Africa where you support local community leaders and you're doing a great job. That's my answer, Charlie. I will not go further thank, into detail. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Yes, but you, you, you said it. They need to do it. They need to make sure they show interest for this issue because internet has become what a very seriously big monster. And we need to not to tame it, but to be friend with it. If we don't, <laughs> we certainly have problems. So at this time, we have a few minutes left. Michelle Tonang is our lead for this session. And uh, at this point of time, I will be very sad if I don't miss it and give the floor to, to lead the, the last mile. As we talk of this last mile here, to lead the last mile of this session and probably give the floor to some of the speakers that he has in the room. So, Michelle, this is my last word. Thank you for giving me the floor and the opportunity to lead this from here. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Charlie. Merci pour cette modération très professionnelle. Euh, compte tenu du fait qu'on est en train d'être pris de coup par le temps, euh, permettez-nous de euh, rendre hommage à ceux qui sont venus en présentiel ici. Et je voudrais euh, me faire l'honneur d'inviter M. Mohamed Nif, qui est le PDG de Tunisie Internet, qui a fait l'honneur de, qui nous a honoré par sa présence, qui a quelques questionnements. Et pour clore euh, notre entretien, nous passerons la parole tout à l'heure à notre pionnier. On a la chance d'avoir un des pionniers de l'Internet en Europe. Nous devons lui rendre hommage. Je vais passer la parole à M. Mohamed, qui a quelques questionnements et contributions. Mohamed Oui, merci. Merci beaucoup, merci. Euh... Monsieur le modérateur, Monsieur Charles. Donc, euh, juste, j'ai voulu poser peut-être, peut-être, j'ai voulu mettre euh, en clair deux, 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 deux points. Premièrement, euh, comme vous le savez, pour, pour connecter le maximum d'individus de, de, et le maximum, maximum d'objets, euh, vu l'arrivée du, du 5G actuellement et vu euh, le, 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 le smart, euh, smart building smart, euh, et tout ce qui est smart euh, automobile, etc., euh, nous, euh, les opérateurs doivent impérativement 
investir. Elles doivent investir d'une manière, d'une manière, d'une avec des grands montants. C'est-à-dire pour pour faire le 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 le, 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 le fixe de band bandwidth ou le, le mobile. Euh, les bandes passantes euh, élevées avec des vitesses élevées, donc ils doivent investir beaucoup et du coup avec le, le business model actuellement, comme vous le savez il y a les, les applications GAFA actuellement, l'utilisation euh, en, en masse de, de, de Viber, de, de Messenger, de, de tout ce qui est voix euh, over IP, donc euh, euh, laisse, laisse les, les revenus, euh, ce n'est pas comme, comme le passé. Donc, il y a, il y a manque de revenus pour les, pour les opérateurs et du coup, ils doivent d'un côté investir et investir beaucoup pour mettre en œuvre l'ADSL, pour les fibres optiques, pour mettre en œuvre toute l'infrastructure nécessaire pour la connexion Internet. Et de l'autre côté, ils se trouvent avec des revenus moins, moins, de plus en plus moins, vu l'utilisation massive de, de, de l'over-IP et de, des applications GAFA. Donc, ce que je, je, je pense peut-être... Euh, juste, je propose euh, modestement à des. Euh, je pense que euh, ces opérateurs doivent être aidés et, et peut-être on doit faire une recommandation, une forte recommandation pour les régulateurs de, 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 de nos pays pour baisser un peu les coûts des de, de, les coûts de, de, des licences, par exemple les licences 5G, ça coûte cher, fréquence, les fréquences ça coûte cher, et peut-être euh, essayer de faire d'une manière collective des pays, euh, d'une manière régionale, euh, essayer de, de faire des, des négociations avec les, avec, euh, avec les, les GAFA, avec les applications, avec les, 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 les grands euh, utilisateurs de Viber, des, des grands, euh, 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 c'est-à-dire euh, des... Euh, les producteurs, les producteurs GAFA, pour, pour faire peut-être des revenus de sharing ou pour faire quelque chose comme ça. Encore, il faut-il encourager le contenu, le contenu local. Et peut-être, vous avez parlé tout à l'heure de l'exchange point, des de, 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 de points d'échange. Peut-être encourager les points d'échange, non seulement au niveau de, de chaque pays, mais au niveau de, régional. Par exemple, si on trouve un groupe de continents, un groupe de, 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 de pays à l'échelle du continent, on peut faire un exchange point, par exemple, à l'échelle du nord du nord de l'Afrique ou à la chair ou à, 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 à tous à tous les pour tout pour beaucoup de groupes à l'échelle africaine donc l'exchange point va permettre l'utilisation meilleure de la bande passante internationale ce qui va ce qui coûte, ce qui, coûte, ce qui coûte cher actuellement et peut-être encourager le, le contenu local et encourager les data centers les, les, les services à valeur ajoutée pour 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 aider les opérateurs à investir de, de plus en plus. Juste deuxième point, c'est l'utilisation de l'IP6. De, 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 euh, Donc, euh, à l'échelle continent, à l'échelle de notre continent africain, et si on voit peut-être le, le, le map euh, sur l'IPv6, euh, je trouve que vous pouvez regarder que, que le, le rang de, de, de notre pays est, est un peu... De, donc, euh, on n'a pas de, 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 le goût de ranking. À, à, à ce niveau. Donc, il faut encourager nos pays à, à passer à, à l'IPv6 pour se préparer au 5G, pour se préparer à, à, à l'Internet euh, dans une meilleure exploitation. Merci beaucoup. Nous sommes pris par le cours du temps. Je vais passer immédiatement la parole à M. Lupouzin pour le mot de fin. Merci. Well, I'm French. I can tell you. Uh... I was born in 1931. So now you, if you make a little calculation, you can find about my age. You know? And that uh, tells me that when, when I was born, there was no informatics. There was no, no computer science. That happens after the Second World War. The German had this, some, some advanced because they had also scientists and they had pushed with the invasion of the Europe by, uh, by Hitler. They had uh, acquired a number of uh, technologies that were available in Europe, especially in Germany. 
and also in England. And that was easier for the, because the English were speaking English, while the European most of the time didn't speak uh, much uh, English. When I, were on, when, I, when I started learning languages, I learned German because we had Germans all around the German army everywhere in France. But suddenly we, we didn't learn, we didn't learn speaking German. We were, we were learning a, a little bit able to, to learn the newspapers. So practically the, the age in which the, the period we live in at the moment has been created with the extraordinary development of uh, computing. And that was uh, perhaps for some countries in the 60s, like the British probably had already uh, acquired a minimum level of uh, experience. In France, it was more like uh, 70s. And the uh, rest of the world, of course, uh, including uh, all the African countries were much behind because they didn't have the opportunity to learn English, which was the, the minimum level of knowledge that was necessary to understand what was going on. So, but after that, um, Europe thinks we keep changing, but they had an advantage because they had started in, let's say in the 60s. And between the 60s and uh, the year 2000, there are 60 years you know, or more. So they had a, the Europe could go faster, not faster, but they could go by steps. And uh, to acquire a, let's say, a certain level of uh, not necessarily independence, but at least of knowledge about the computer age takes time not only learning the language, but also traveling because you have to meet people who are already trained and uh, you can learn from the neighbors for your people you know in other countries. But that takes a long time. And uh, the difficulty for countries like Africa is that technically they have many more years to to catch up uh, since uh, it started to be uh, well known in uh, countries like Europe. And that of course means that countries who, which start learning the computer age now have to go much faster than the European have done. That means it's uh, it's, it requires from the, the new countries a tremendous amount of, uh, let's say, uh, legislation, training, money, of course, education, and so on. So it takes, it takes many more years to reach the point uh, which have been reached uh, by, by the European and uh, China, for example, was much behind, but now they're about the same level than the European, or sometimes even more. So, I mean, the, the computer age now is a, is a sort of a contest who, go, who goes faster. And this is how to make, how to make quick, quick progress now not just because you're more intelligent, but because you have to know everything that's going on someplace else in the world. Now, for example, it wouldn't be impossible to do computing if you don't have a minimum of education in English, and if you know the American. And I would say now you have to know the Chinese too. So you have to catch up several generations of people in order to be, let's say, valuable in terms of a, a creator, in terms of employee, in terms of researchers, and in terms of life also, in terms of way of life. 
because these new technologies require new buildings, new, um, new ways of doing business, new ways of traveling and so on. And again, that doesn't occur instant, instantly. First, you have to copy what's being done someplace else. But that takes money, that takes education. It's not something you only have to look at screens. You have to start integrating in your life what other kind of uh, countries have been doing to reach that point. So I think that's, that's much, more, much more difficult. And in a way, sometimes, uh, I would say desperating, but sometimes it looks it's not, re not realistic to be able to reach what has been reached in other countries. But that, I think, even though it might look like this, I think the, the human mind has also fantastic capacity to learn. It doesn't mean that they have to read books or talk to other people. They have to be in a, in a situation uh, starting from their young age and then edu edu mm -hmm. the to get education and so on. On est au-dessus de notre temps. And also travel. Est-ce que vous pouvez conclure? Okay. Uh. Merci beaucoup. Merci uh, uh, à tous les panélistes. Merci, M. Le Cousin. Merci à M. Mohamed. Merci à Belga. Merci à tous ceux qui sont en ligne. Johanna, uh, Eric, Henrik, uh, Martial. Merci à toute la technique qui a bien voulu nous accorder uh, cette attention pour que ce soit un succès. Merci à tous ceux qui ont voulu participer en ligne et en présentiel à cet atelier. Merci du fond du cœur, de la part au nom de l'IGF Cameroun, au nom de l'IGF tout court. Bonne journée et bon AGF à tout le monde. Au revoir. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.